Hi, I'm Brian Lord, president of Premier Speakers Bureau and the host of the Beyond Speaking podcast. Today, I'm, I'm very excited. I love stories. I love drama. I love adventure. And you couldn't ask for anybody more than, than Yossi Ginsberg. So Yossi, thanks for coming on today. Great pleasure, Brian. Thank you. Now, I just finished your book, uh, Jungle. And you've got this, uh, this movie coming out uh, starring Daniel Radcliffe as you, as Yossi. What do you, what, if you're watching this movie and somebody comes in, how are you like and how are you different than Daniel Radcliffe? And so most people, if you don't know the name, that is the, the character who's most, most well known for playing Harry Potter. That's right. How are you like, how are you different from him? Look, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm so honored because he's, uh, he's an iconic figure, you know, like yeah. I think if they make a time capsule of this century, um, he will be in, you know, yes. I mean, Harry Potter for sure. So, and he's a great actor, so I'm, I'm honored. And he's doing also a great job as an actor. But I don't think he plays me. I don't think when I see the movie, it's not me. Mm -hmm. He's playing my character. <laughs> he's following the storyline that I cannot identify, even though, uh, you know, it, 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 it tried. I give him that. And he interviewed me for many hours. And he asked a list of what music I was listening to, which books I was reading at the time when I was uh, uh, 22. Um, he had a coach, a, a, a diction coach, you know, to, 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 to grasp the um, accent. But I don't, somehow I don't identify with that character as me. Maybe it's a protection mechanism of my own, you know, because this, the movie is uh, such an externalization of, of my story. It's a process that took a lot for me just to let go. So maybe it's part of the, of the let go. But as I say, he's doing a great job. It does follow the storyline mm -hmm. and it's very powerful. Uh, for those listening, we got to cheat a little bit and watch a, a couple of the scenes from the movie, and it's just it just looks amazing, and uh, and just the even just the scenes that we saw, just very gripping and, and emotional, and and um, and so take us back to that time. How did you decide to go down there, and what made you go on this specific adventure into the Amazon with a couple of friends and a uh, and a guide? Well, I say never underestimate the power of a naive dreamer because <laughs> <laughs> you got to be naive to be a dreamer. You know, if you're a skeptic, then your dreaming is escapism because ah, it will never happen. So it's escapism. You dream, but you'll never try. Escapism is a bad form of dreaming. And the naive dreamer is one that is bright eyed and has no choice, but you know, his heart is going for it. And, um, I say, you know, like when, when I have a dream, I don't say I have a dream. I say the dream as me. The moment I have a dream, I start working for the dream. And this was the case. This was an obsession for many years. I read many adventure books and I got fascinated with the Amazon. But it was much more specific. I had a plan and the plan was based on a book I read that is called Papillon by Henri Charrier. In this book uh, is a prisoner in the Devil's Island mm -hmm. and he manages to escape and he's washed to the shores of Venezuela. Um, uh, escaping into the forest is found by a tribe and is adopted by the tribe. And the chief likes him. So he offers his daughter. So he marries the chief's daughter. A sister gets really upset. So he marries the sister as well. So there he is in the middle of the Amazon, married to the two beautiful daughters of the chief, <laughs> finding gold and pearls and all that. I said, this is, I'm going to do that. But I was serious. I was so naive. I was serious. So when you have a dream, you know, there's also like obstacles. I had to, once I, I was released from the military service, because we do mandatory three years, I was 21. I worked for a year just to save enough money so I can travel. I, I got to South America. I traveled for another year. Mm. Finally, I found my adventure in the form of an Austrian geologist in the streets of La Paz mm -hmm. that offered me to join him in, into the Uncharted to encounter a tribe that was never explored to culture before, the Toromonas, and to find gold in the river. Of course, when somebody tells you your own dream, what can you do but follow them? <laughs> He was a con artist. This was uh, not true, but I didn't know that. And two of my friends joined me, and this has turned to a bigger than life misadventure. Two of us never came back. One is the guide, actually. The Austrian never came back. Yeah. Nor my best friend at the time, the Swiss uh, 
um, backpackers that traveled with me. And uh, so that's what brought me there. I would say my life was saved by, by, by my friend, uh, the only one of us that made it out. But his life was saved by indigenous people that came back with him to save me. Mm -hmm. So I went back to this indigenous, indigenous people, mm -hmm. the only tribes that lived in that remote part of the world. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I realized my dream. I became one of the tribe. Mm. I found riches, not of gold, but much more than that. I've, I understood what the diversity means to the world. Mm -hmm. I got married in the Amazon. I brought my own wife, not the daughter <laughs> of the chief. I brought the, I brought the wife <laughs> with me, but I did get married in the middle of the Amazon in a shamanic a ritual with lots of indigenous people in deep, deep in the Amazon. So when you really, you know, you go for your dream, in the end life uh, helps you. But there's a lot of obstacles on the way. Now, I, I, in reading the book there, you don't have to give the entire movie away, but, but what are some of the ways that, uh, some of the challenges you face, some of the things you escaped? I love the, the Jaguar story. So I'm, I'm kind of cheating and hoping that comes in here. But what are a couple of the challenges that you faced while you were alone in the Amazon? I think the word alone is the main challenge. This was the biggest one, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that was my also biggest realization, how much we are social, you know, how much, you know. And till this day, I'm telling you, my assets are my friends. That's my richness in life is, is, is friendship. Uh, this was the most difficult, you know, the first thing was survival food and protection, Jaguar. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like the need, the need was human contact, mm -hmm. you know. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about sex or something like that. It was just companionship, you know. I, I was hallucinating all the time, but I never hallucinating about sex. I just hallucinated about food mm -hmm. and companionship. So I guess those are very, very deep, basic needs. Mm -hmm. And the one is, of course, just uh, substance, but me immediately after substance is a connection, human connection. Um, and there was no way out of that uh, loneliness. And the only thing I could do is actually hallucinate. Mm -hmm. I hallucinated uh, um, to survive. Mm -hmm. Again, the power of dreaming, the power of Im imagining. Uh, I didn't sleep for 20 days, mm. uh, and not even one night. For the 20 nights that I spent there, not even one night I slept. So my only way to recover and to regenerate and to rest um, was to actually hallucinate because it allowed me to rest. So I would hallucinate all the time. Um, at a certain point, and this is a very powerful story, um, I was already 15 days alone when a flood took me. Mm. Um, I escaped the flood to the hills. Uh, two days later, after the flood receded, I was in a very bad shape. I was already crawling on my elbows and knees, and an airplane passed in the sky. When I heard this plane, I understood it's searching for me, but the flood pushed me deep under the canopy, and I was running and screaming, and the airplane just totally oblivious mm -hmm. left me behind. And something snapped inside of me and I just collapsed and I cried and cried and then, you know, I started praying and I, I gave up. I said, please God, just let me, let me die. I don't want to... And I totally gave up. So it was a relief in giving up. At that moment, it's the most unbelievable thing. Somebody started crying next to me. So I'm lying there in the mud. And I hear somebody's like sobbing next to me. And this is impossible. I'm alone. Mm -hmm. But somebody's there crying. And it's so weird. But I hear it. that I raise my head. And I look. I can't believe it. There's a woman next to me in the mud. I jumped on my feet. And when I see her, I have like an understanding now. Like the airplane may come back. We cannot afford wasting time. So I start screaming at her. Get up. Get up. And I pull her from the mud. And I start running for her you know, searching for, like, to, to, to find an opening so the, the airplane can see us. So I'm pulling her and running with her. For two days, non-stop, I'm talking to this girl, taking care of her. At the, two days later, at night, I'm finding myself making her a place to sleep next to me. Not in my head, under the tree. Now I'm injured. I'm one big open wound. I, I haven't eaten you know, since the flood, nothing. I'm basically just skin hanging over bone. Mm -hmm. 
mm. and I'm making the effort to make a camp for two people, breaking palm fronds and calling her next to me, and then I see there's nobody there. I, 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 what I want to tell you, Brian, is that as opposed to my hallucinations, that were, were my imaginations that I used, this wasn't my hallucination. I didn't make it up. I, it wasn't me. So, I don't know who created this girl. If she was imagination, I cannot take ownership of that because it just came to me. And I don't know what to make of it. What I know is that she saved my life. She did save my life because I gave up on life. But the way she saved my life is genius. She didn't come to help me. She needed my help. What saved my life was that somebody else needed my help. So how amazing it is. You know, I couldn't do anything for myself, but the moment somebody needed me, I suddenly found the power to get up and help her. You know, and that's I understood something about life. Power is given when you give it. This was uh, one thing about her. Um, one of the, you know, most amazing miracles for me is the appearance of that girl. And again, you know, the powers that, uh, you know, we in, in, in the connection. The Jaguar, I'll give you the Jaguar as well. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, and the Jaguar, look, there are many <coughs> Jaguars around me. And that's why I, I was hallucinating at night, because there was no morning that I wouldn't see the powers of Jaguars around the place where I slept. They were around me every night. Now I had no fire, I had no gun, I had no knife, and I couldn't sleep. And I know the jaguars are walking there. My only way to deal with it was just escape by hallucination, just to avoid them. But on the sixth night, you know, like somebody, some, something was just breaking, you know, I heard something moving next to me. Um, at that stage, you know, like I found a few things in the river, like one of the bags, and I had um, a lighter and a, in, in that bag there was a mosquito repellent, there was like a, a mosquito net and also a, a lighter. So I slept with the lighter and the mosquito repellent as my weapon. That was my only weapon because I knew I can, I can set it on fire. And I had also a very faint, I mean dying uh, um, flashlight. And so I put the flashlight on a couple of times and then I see the cat, you know, like a big cat, just maybe about six yards from me. And, you know, I panicked. But then I managed to put the, you know, the, the, the flashlight in my, in my mouth and I just took the can and I just sprayed at it, you know, like sprayed fire at it. And I managed to chase it away, you know. It's... Um, I don't know how I survived the Jaguars. I don't know because they were there and it was a very tough rainy season. Mm. And there are many miracles in this story. You know, like I, I say about this, Brian, that the miracles that I saw, they didn't have time to put the veil. I, I just saw the miracles happening. You just saw one, you know, with the boat mm. turning yeah. in the place where I collapsed, you know, in 120 miles of search. They stopped to turn the boat where I collapsed the night before, you know, it's like things like that. that everybody that was present in the moment could feel. Mm. It's not just coincidence, you know, I wasn't supposed to die. I wasn't supposed to die, you know, like something. And I never um, rationalized that. You know, I never say, oh, no, it's a state of mind. No. Uh, and in, in that sense, I found my faith as well. Mm. Now, obviously, your story is, is so unique of, you know, uh, going through the Amazon, being alone, fighting off, you know, jaguars. And so how does someone who is not experiencing that, what do they take away from your story? When people come up to you or email you afterwards, what, what do they take away from it? Like, how do you know that this is hitting home with them? Yeah, well, I tell you, that because, you know, I wasn't a, an extreme sport person. I wasn't like a I was just a, a, a guy, you know. I didn't think of myself as able to survive that. I was actually sure that I will die a terrible, miserable, torturous death. I was sure. And I didn't have what it takes. That was my, you know, that's the state of mind that I was in. The elements were 
too, you know, too big and mighty. And the circumstances were the worst possible circumstances, you know, like uh, in the midst of, of a, a terrible rainy season alone, so far from civilization, hundreds of miles away from civilization. And that's what people take, you know, my self-discovery, you know. My self-discovery is that we're much stronger, you know, we're much wiser. And, you know, when, when you lose everything, maybe you lose also the self-doubt and the un inadequacy and self un unworthiness that sometimes we feel towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that we are not in survival situation, we are victims of non-survival. That's mm -hmm. the, when people are in survival situations, they rise. I tell you, my story is exotic. Mm -hmm. But my ex-wife, she was going through birth cancer, and she was going through chemotherapy and radiation. And you know what? The entire family leaned on her, not supported her, leaned on her. Mm -hmm. When she faced all that, she rose so big. Because when we face death, when survival is a real survival, we rise. Mm. Naturally we rise. We do find the power. And it's so tremendous that other people can draw this power from us, you know. This is the secret of survival. Survival empowers us. Survival is the meaning of life. It's actually the true meaning of life. It's survival. Because what are we doing here? We're here to hang on every single breath. That's the purpose of life. It's preservation. It's the purpose. It's sacred purpose. And we are drawn so far from it. And it's obstructed but so many nonsense. I mean, one moment of survival, all the nonsense disappear. Who cares about what they say and the titles and the money? Uh, just give me one more breath, one more breath, you know? Ask a dying person, one more breath is worth more than anything, you know? It's sacred. So, that reminder, uh, and you know, they feel it because I touch it, you know? So, I don't tell them, they experience it. That's what a good storyteller would do, because I, um, I let them experience it emotionally, not, uh, not think about ideas. And people cry and they go through something. Yesterday I was on a, a conference and, you know, this woman said, I'm, you know, I'm changed, you know, like, and that's, uh, I, w I, I look at that as a rare gift and I thread very, very gingerly because people open their hearts to me. People allow me to touch their souls. So. That's a huge privilege and I'll never abuse it. Yeah.